Welcome to our fourth series of To The Barn Chats With. This series is the Equestrian Expert series and we have some incredibly interesting guests who are all professionals in the equestrian world in varying areas. Today we are joined by the lovely Nicole Brown. Nicole is nothing short of a superwoman. She hosts multiple equestrian pod- productions for major broadcasters around the world, hosts the Equa Ratings Eventing and US Eventing podcasts, commentates at multiple national and international events across the country, finds time to vlog her busy days at work, has a toddler keeping her hands full and isn't shy of a DIY job and caravan living. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> what an intro. <laughs> I'm tired <laughs> just thinking about all of that. <laughs> I, know, I don't know how you how you fit it all in. <laughs> oh, neither do I. Neither do I. <laughs> Last time we spoke, it was, um, well, actually when we met over Zoom, and it was when, it was last summer, ahead of the um, event and manager launch for Arc and Digital. Yeah. So it's been just great. I'm so excited to chat to you tonight. I have a long list of questions. My really- favourite kind. Um, so, great. So, how are you, and how does it feel to be back out competing? Oh, do you know what? It is so nice to get some sort of normality back I guess I mean it was such a strange year last year for so many reasons for everybody and everybody was affected in different ways Um, you know a lot of riders were at home and the horses sort of were kept ticking over and then they got out competing at the back end of the year I actually only did one live event last year um yeah so I only made it to oh I I tell a lie I actually was at Lincoln the weekend before everything got shut down but then I only went to Virgin International and that was it so it was a really really strange year and I did loads of stuff remotely I did loads of stuff from home and as you mentioned house renovation to keep us busy as well (laughs) um but I I just love I'm really lucky I love my job and it's just great isn't it it just makes and seeing everybody even though it's a little bit different and you sort of see people with a face mask on you're like do I know you (laughs) they they can't see you smile awkwardly um but it's just oh it's just a it's a real treat yeah makes me appreciate it more I think I think that's totally it if that's something that we can take from this last year it's that we are so lucky to appreciate and love our jobs and you know yeah some people were in some really rubbish situations last year so yeah, no, absolutely. It's definitely made us appreciate it more. Um, so you were at Western last weekend. Yes. Um, yeah. That. It would. You know what? It was absolutely brilliant. It's always one of my favourite events. I first. It was my first big event to go and sort of commentate on. Uh, you know the big combinations and the advanced and that kind of thing. So it always is a little bit special. I did my first international there as well. Live commentary. Oh God, I want to say like two thousand. 14 ish okay. maybe a bit earlier 2030 maybe um so it's always special they're a really really great team of people the plants do an incredible job and it's kind of like going home a little yeah. bit it's always a highlight in my spring calendar so it was lovely to be back and we loved your vlog I loved it um <laughs> so interesting I've been eventing since I was tiny at pony club but learning about the cross country control box it was so interesting and I'm just like the behind the scenes was amazing and I didn't know I love how it's still very manual and you just move along every time they get to a fence because the old way is the best way I love that it was so interesting I am a very amateur blogger I'm not gonna lie um I go and sort of take a few videos and um I really enjoy it actually it's really nice to kind of piece it together um but cross country control I actually when I first started commentating I part of my sort of ambition and and something that I love doing was cross country control and I trained as a controller so I was one of the first people I think I was the first person to sort of graduate as such from the British eventing controller program um, which has grown loads over the last few years and I love it I really really love it I haven't done as much of it in the last couple of years but I just I was a little bit twitchy uh, at sitting back in the hot seat at Weston. Um, but the moment I got both headsets on and you have both your radio networks and you're sort of that person in charge of the cross country, it's like, okay, yeah, it's yeah, back. I, I, um, I, that's, a, that's an intense job and there's a lot to listen to. I was, I, I watched it and I was like, I don't think I could do that. I have all these different voices going on and lots to think about. But yeah, you look like you've been doing it your whole life and very happily doing it. Is it's practice, practice, yeah. practice, practice, and then you get used to sort of hearing the the things that you need to hear 
Yeah. Um, the worst thing, I'm not going to lie, is when you have competitors going round with the fours in their number and excitable fence judges who tend to scream like four, 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 and you're like, and actually it's just four, 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 his clear of fence four or something. Oh, um, but it yeah. always makes you a bit like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, this is something that I'd ne- never even thought about. Um, so how did you keep yourself entertained during lockdown one, two, and three? Oh, well, the aforementioned uh, renovation. <laughs> so um, we basically moved house in the November of 2019. And we've done a couple of renovation projects before. And they were, we lived in a, a touring caravan for 10 months on our last house, yeah. which was, to be honest, without a toddler. Uh, definitely couldn't have done it with a toddler but we somehow we somehow came out the other side still married um and so we bought a new house November 2019 and it needed a lot of work which we knew that's the kind of thing that we love anyway it was it's our forever home which is a really really lovely thing to kind of get stuck into because everything we've done before has been sort of like oh well it'll do for for now or you know we're looking at the bigger picture but we always said there would be one move left and this was it. Um, and it was a bit of a gamble because we sold our old house and this hadn't gone through and everything else. But so, yeah, so essentially we have lived in a static caravan for 18 months with a toddler. So he was just turned one when we first moved into the caravan. Um, oh. Wasn't very mobile then. And of course, has got a lot more mobile over the last few months. Um and so we spent first lockdown um, ripping it to pieces, uh, which I'm not going to lie, was a great outlet. <laughs> I love knocking stuff out. My motto in life is, if in doubt, knock it out. <laughs> um, so that was a lot of fun. And then we, I guess the second lockdown work on the house had started. Um, so that was quite nice because we did all of the clearance ourselves and then we had a builder in to sort of you know do the the proper stuff and then I was kind of involved in managing it but not as much as I was with our last house which was quite nice actually um and then the last lockdown we were doing all the finishing touches so lockdown three was sort of finishing touch lockdown and it feels really strange because obviously for us it's been quite a journey but for people that I've not seen for the last 18 months I go to an event and they're like oh yeah so you bought a new house you moved you're in and I'm like if only it was that that simple (laughs) um and I'm not gonna lie it was it was fairly challenging at times but the moment you get in the house sort of melts away I love it so much and I'm a little bit sad don't tell my husband this little bit sad that this is the last house that we'll be uh, <laughs> knocking about but it's okay because the buildings and stuff outside have still got loads and loads and loads of work to do so we will not be bored and yeah it's going to keep us busy for a good while so um yes that's basically renovating a house entertaining a toddler drinking copious amounts of wine to get through it all <laughs> and um recording trillions of podcasts basically <laughs> Well, it sounds like you're very, very productive. And, and it's like you said, it's just so nice to put your own touches on your home and it be your forever home. I've done a similar thing and I felt like, oh gosh, I, I I'm not sure if I'm ready for it to be finished yet. And then I was reminded that there's so much left to do in the garden and like you say, the outbuildings and we built stables and lockdown one. So I was like, okay, yeah, no, it's fine. We're going <laughs> to need to stop at some point. <laughs> it's a momentary, it's a momentary lapse, Gabby. And then you just got to get, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I'll do something else to keep me busy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> cool. So um, we'll just chat a little bit about your childhood and growing up and what were your hobbies and what were you like at school? So I was properly pony mad. Um, I was really lucky growing up in so much as I, and my parents were unbelievably supportive. My dad um, was a farm manager. My mum was a farm secretary. Um, so we were very lucky at home, but ponies were very much my sort of treat. And I loved that. Like it, we were, I, that was all I wanted. So I didn't want holidays, didn't want new clothes, anything like that. I just wanted my pony in life. I think once I fell over on holiday, scraped my knee quite badly didn't want my mum didn't want my dad just wanted my pony (laughs) one of the rare trips that we took and I think I was traumatized by the fact I was away for too long and it was a couple of days um (laughs) so really really lucky growing up and got an older brother Philip who was really into sailing 
and then I sort of did pony club, um, hunted every weekend that I could, um, had a real sort of eclectic bunch of ponies that all were quite quirky and were quite fun, but just loved it. Absolutely loved it. Felt very, very lucky. Um, I loved school. I still look back at school years and think, God, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I wasn't yeah. at all popular. Um, but I was a proper teacher's pet and you could guarantee that if somebody asked a question, I'd be like, me, me, I know the answer, I know the answer. Um, so yeah, I, I was really lucky. I had a lovely, lovely childhood, rode throughout, um, and just sort of, I guess at that point had absolutely no idea what I was going to go and do with my life, but, um, just was very lucky. So it wasn't something that you always thought you wanted to do. You were just kind of just pony mad and focusing on, yeah. on riding? I always had a bit of a, a little bit of a hankering over something like that. But weirdly, I I was quite shy and didn't, um, was not good with public speaking at all. Like really that, no, honestly, um, really was not a public speaking fan. If I had to get up in class to go to the front of the classroom for something, even like to walk out the door, I can still remember the fear and the cold sweats. Like I was that sort of um, nervous. So interesting. I know, and 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 do you know what? It's so at odds with me now. Yeah. But Literally, I, my next question was like, how did your childhood influence what you do now? And it's like totally. Opposite. I know. You were. I know. It's it's really strange. I would say that I so I rode throughout my um, teenage years, evented not very successfully. Um, I won't lie, I was quite pleased when the British Eventing website changed over, they lost my old B record. <laughs> and I was like, oh dear, what a shame. <laughs> um, probably in an archive somewhere, but never mind. Um, but loved it. Uh, and was on a you know a home produced horse that went up to, to novice level and did did an intermediate, not very successfully. But um so then I sold him when I was 18. My dad was really unwell. And so I we sold him. It was always the plan that I would sell him when I was going to go off to university. And um, actually, dad became more unwell, but my horse had already gone at this point. So I was like, OK, well, that money, I'll keep it for when I'm old enough and ready to you know, buy another horse at some point. And it actually went into a house deposit. Um, I'm so, argue that's a bit more sensible. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to lie. Looking back, actually, it was probably the best thing I could have done at the time. But mm. it was a bit of a wrench. Heart-wrenching, yeah. Yeah, yeah. massively, massively. Yeah. Um, but after that, I wanted to stay involved in the sport. Um, my dad had passed away by this point. Um, and so I wanted to stay involved. Didn't really know what to do I was working actually at this point um university didn't work out so I think okay. my dad was very very ill when I went and I hated it I wanted to come home um did you study I went to study to be a land agent believe it or not oh, um where did you go Harper Adams Harper Adams yeah Harper Adams <laughs> yeah and and do you know what it was it would be one of those that it just wasn't it wasn't right for me people loved it um but it wasn't right for me I wanted to be at home it's unique yeah absolutely and and so um was at home for sort of a few months um and actually started working I was riding for the people in bits and pieces but actually got a job um working for Nottingham Lincolnshire and Derbyshire Rugby Football Union so like rugby basically okay. um but in in our area and the guy that was the chairman of NLD at the time basically um I didn't know it but ran a local horse trials called Winkburn which doesn't run anymore and we then actually bought our first house Oliver and I together in Winkburn he said oh well come down and you know have a go and just have a wander around I said I've always wanted to commentate he said well pop into the control box you can see how it all works and go from there and um I literally remember the moment that I had a microphone handed to me and they basically said like just go for it and I loved it I honestly I didn't I would have always sort of thought well oh, you know interesting might like it talk a lot might come in handy for something one day I just loved it. Absolutely loved it. Amazing. Um, Especially yeah, during, I thought you were going to say, oh, I completely froze, uh, you know, like after you're saying it at school. But that's amazing. It's incredible. I don't know why. I, I don't know whether it was because when I first started, when you're in a cross-country control box, I guess you're kind of hidden. 
Yeah. So you're a speaker, like you're a voiceover speaker, yeah. but people don't necessarily see you. Yeah. Um, but I just loved it. Absolutely. I loved making it interesting. I loved the kind of, um, you know, being able to add to it. Yes. So I noticed that when I was watching your Western vlog is, is your talent at adding to it and it not just being like, oh, and here's this combination going through A, B and C, but you're describing the jumps they're taking and what the partnership have achieved and what they're setting out to do today, you know, and, and that's, that comes from just a basic, like lifelong knowledge of horses and eventing that you can't always make in someone, you know, you had that and, and it, it's a real talent that you've got to really describe. Um, and yeah, I saw it the other day and I was like, oh, that, that's, that's a real unique talent to have. That's so, really kind, passion, definitely passion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's fascinating um, that you, yeah, that you just like literally took the microphone and jumped and that was it. <laughs> but I would say, I mean, I was, I think, 19 at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and I've, I've spoken about this before a bit, but coming into what is traditionally male dominated as a 19 year old girl was fairly tough. Like there were a lot of, of sort of knockbacks or, you know, I, think a few people probably didn't take me seriously um yeah. so you know it wasn't it wasn't a straightforward path once I decided actually that was something I really wanted to do more of but I was fair I was fairly to sort of um persistent shall we say so what did you do so you, you started there and then how how did it grow further like you say if you got knocked down in a few places and and what was that path so I basically I started um sort of volunteering offering helping um I guess being part of a team and sort of making myself useful basically and and sort of had a a couple of opportunities through um contacts that I had sort of made at events that I'd been to and sort of tried to help out and they'd sort of gone okay well when you ask us next time there might be an opportunity here or there and um, I then was also training to be a controller. So what, as I mentioned earlier, I was trying to sort of do that as well. It, it's not only, uh, personally, I really enjoy it anyway, but as a controller, you are a better commentator. And as a commentator, you make a better controller because you understand both jobs. You sit side by side in the control box and it makes a massive difference. If you're a controller and you know that the commentator sat next to you, is on your side and is your second pair of eyes and ears and will say oh did you get that or make sure that everybody is where they are meant to be or if everything goes horribly wrong and there's a fall at the end of the course and there's five horses traveling very quickly towards it yeah that that person is able to sort of you know help and be a team um so I love doing both of those things and it, it makes you more useful to be completely honest it does make you more useful to an organizer you might only have three people in a control box throughout the day and if you've got people that can do everything then you know you're more valuable um so it really sort of grew from there and I just I I sort of kept asking I kept making myself useful as I say and opportunities popped up and when they came I grabbed them um and did my best and made sure I was prepared and worked really 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 hard yeah. And then more opportunities kind of came from it. Um, yeah. You know, there's a few knockbacks along the way, but ultimately, you know, it, it sort of grew and grew and grew. Sure. You reap what you sow. And if you're yeah. there saying, right, I'll do this for free. I'll work for free. I'll volunteer. Yeah, you reap the rewards and you get the opportunities. Um, so Tara really wanted to know. She asked me to ask you multiple times. <laughs> she said, how did you become such an inventing, eventing encyclopedia? Because she said, she said, in her own words, she goes, we don't think that we've ever met anyone with as much eventing trivia stored in their head as you. <laughs> That's actually amazing. That makes me very, very, very happy. Um, honest answer is I'm lucky because I love it. Mm. it and, and so it interests me. But hard work, like I read a lot. I do a lot of research. I look at results. I read websites. I look on social media. I do a lot of groundwork. Um, and... I think the groundwork that you put in when you then pick up the microphone, it becomes instinct. It's, it's and the job that you, you we don't see, you do. Yes. So yeah. I yeah, if I see or watch you commentating, I'm like, oh how did she just pluck that out? But like 
I never thought that. You, you're sitting home researching and like you say, you t- take it all in. And then when you get the microphone somewhere, you find it in your brain. You're like, oh, yeah, I've got that fact. I've got that fact. That's really interesting. It's definitely like a lot, a lot of hours. Anybody that wants to do it, just do your homework. At the end of the day, do your homework because you never know what's going to pop up. But if you do your homework, I'm lucky, as I say, because I love it. So, you know, it, it's really interesting to me. And um, I do things now that I could have only dreamed of growing up. But, it, you know, hard work will get you a long way. Yeah. So definitely do your But I, yeah, I am also quite lucky because I do remember random stuff. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, so who are your main influences in life, both in business and day to day? Um. So to be honest, I would probably say my husband. So Oliver, um, we've been married nearly eight years. We got together when I was 18. Um, so I'm 31 now. So we've been together for a very long time. And we're a team, basically. Um, I respect him massively because he works unbelievably hard. His work ethic is just absolutely incredible. Um and so, you know, you can't do something on your own if you, you know, I've got a family at home. So it's a team effort. And, you know, he's always been the one that would give me a little bit of a push if I, you know, don't have much confidence in myself, which at times I really don't. He'll always be the one that sort of says, no, absolutely, you can do this. Um, so he's my biggest cheerleader. My probably, you know, the one that will make sure I'm kept grounded and, um on the right path then I don't think I could wish for anything else to be honest no absolutely that's that's so wonderful to have someone that backs you when you sometimes don't back yourself yes yeah Um, especially in I think the eventing world even if you're not a rider but as a professional in the eventing world yourself it's uh we can take as big a fools as the riders sometimes (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) absolutely and and you know any any criticism or anything like that, you know, you always hold on to the negatives, don't you? Like it's that one negative comment or that one negative um, sort of message or moment or the thing you did wrong. I'm I'm a real monkey for if I, I mean, I can guarantee we'll do this interview and I will play it back in my head and be like, oh God, why didn't I say that? That would have been loads better. Um, but do you know what? That's how you learn, isn't it? It's human. Great. <laughs> like we're all human absolutely do you get much negative feedback no generally speaking I I have a really sort of I I would like to think I'm a nice person um but <laughs> I'd like to think I am um but I very much sort of I would take I would be quite sensitive and I, so I would want people to like me basically um and I guess there's always the odd message isn't there there's always the odd I always remember we did a podcast survey back a couple of years ago on the eventing podcast and we basically said to our listeners um you know what what do you like what would you like to change everything else and somebody made a comment about they didn't like the girl with the queen's english accent it's a bit like hmm, that's not very nice that's um, so mean. And, but the, the, do you know what? And then and somebody else, I think, said, oh, love the podcast, but would it would be great if you changed all of the presenters. And I was like, well, that's not really the podcast anymore. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so, no, you don't. You don't. And, and to be honest, you know, the handful that I've had, I can kind of look back on and go, well, and you can't not everybody is going to like you. Not everybody is going to like what you do. A hundred percent get that. And I think I'm getting better at that as yeah. I get older. But I think it's also human nature to always kind of you know, remember those ones Absolutely. rather than remember the lovely, lovely, lovely messages. Yeah. So, and, and people are so sure. nice. Yeah. And it's about making sure that those negative comments that you, like, I sometimes feel when I feel like I've got negative feedback on something, I'm like, I'm going to turn that into a positive and I'm going to use it as fuel to better myself. Absolutely. And nine times out of ten coming from someone that's jealous. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So what has been your biggest lesson in life? Um, I would probably say at the time that my dad was ill and um, so he was diagnosed with cancer when I was about 16 I think Um, and he was unbelievably brave unbelievably positive and his outlook on life was just remarkable and he was so strong and 
had such a positive attitude and I just thought you know what like if you can channel that that is that's something special and so I always think of that and I would say that's something I try and take through life now of do you know what actually there are positives to take um and don't let you think don't think you're beaten you know even if you're down or things aren't going your way or whatever you know keep holding on keep pushing keep striving keep working hard because actually there is there is more and you can come out the other side of it so I would say that yeah 100 percent. and I, I kind of carry that and apply it to life as much as I possibly can that's nice that he unknowingly left you something that you carry through your life every day yeah absolutely yeah. and he he was a remarkable remarkable man he was very very funny um and he was very relaxed very chilled out but had a, a core of steel and you know he was he was inspirational so I would say that definitely yeah super special really yeah, special absolutely of course so we'll talk a little bit about more about your career um so what would you say are your career highlights so far if you could narrow them down because I'm geeking out on like everything that you've done <laughs> To be honest, sometimes I pinch myself and I'm like, you got to do that. Um, so cool. so I, I have to like, the, my 12 year old eventing fan girl is like <laughs> going crazy inside me. Um, I would probably say my first burly for the BBC. It, cool. it was 2016. And to be honest, I couldn't believe that I'd been asked. And I didn't tell a single soul. I don't even think until the day because I mean my close yeah, close yeah. family knew because I didn't want it like I didn't want somebody to go right, turn around and go oh yeah actually you don't wait anymore yeah. or oh it was a joke um and not that it was <laughs> but you know you kind of think oh, don't jinx it don't jinx it yeah yeah so you know I had grown up listening to Mike Tucker and Ian Stark and for me you know Mike was the the voice of equestrian sport he yeah. was incredible yeah. and so to be alongside them and they were so kind um it was just like a a real dream moment I made the mistake of asking how many people would watch the red button and I think I went a bit green and was like yeah <laughs> okay well no pressure no pressure um but yeah wow that's incredible and to be working alongside your childhood heroes 100 yeah amazing and so I've got I've got here what's your fav- favorite aspect of your job um, pretty well-rounded great job that you enjoy pretty much all of it yeah I love all of it I love talking to people I love interviewing people I love digging beneath the surface and and there's a real and I'm sure you find this as well that there's a real thrill in not only talking to somebody that is obviously really confident and happy and will chat about anything but somebody that is a little bit nervous or is unsure or hasn't done it much before, or you kind of have to coax things out of them. Yeah. Put them ease. I love interviewing people. I love learning more about people. Um, it's really strange being on the other side of this. I kind of want to start turning the tables and be like, oh, Gabby. Um, yeah. But I just love, I love that sort of side of things. I love learning about people. And the eventing community is a great one. Yeah, it is. And everyone's got a story. So and yeah. it's, like you said, it's finding out that story is, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Um, so who and which brands support and, and or sponsor you? So I am very lucky. Again, it's sort of another pinch me moment. I um, am an ambassador for Annabelle Brooks, who are a, a country lifestyle clothing brand. Oh, yeah. And they have. Yeah. yeah. And so I actually did a photo shoot for her when I was in my second uni- year of uni um, with her headbands. So she oh. came to, yeah, she brought them down and came to my parents' yard and I did, did some photos on the gallops with um, a friend of ours modelling them. And so I've always watched her since. Um, yeah. And I thought those earrings, I love them. They're really funky. I don't, you know, I'm a mum these days and I don't really <laughs> get a chance to get glammed up or anything. And they just make me feel like I'm absolutely on top of the world. Yeah. Um, it, do you know what? I, I feel... It's really, really lovely to work with a brand that has similar sort of values. You know, Belle has been through um, a couple of battles with cancer herself. She has a great, great mindset and she she really gives back. You know, she supports various cancer charities. She's supported NHS charities together with Rainbow Sweatshirts um, over the last sort of nine months, year. And do you know what? That's a, that's a privilege to be involved in. And I always feel very proud and very lucky to represent such lovely people. 
Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and the head warmers, I'm not going to lie, have been a lifesaver this winter. They're amazing. I get comments online all the time because she's like, oh, I'll pay you in a head warmer. I was like, yes, yes please. Yes, please. I've been wearing it, God, I don't know, I don't know how many years, seven, seven eight years. And yeah, it, like, I always get comments on it. It's, yeah, they're gorgeous. She's very clever. She's like very hug, It's a hug for your head. Yeah. I like to <laughs> sort of think of it. And I actually got mine before, I guess it was winter last year. And we were in the caravan. And there would be many a times I would just be in the caravan with the head warmer on, quite happy. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, brilliant. Um, who inspires you in your field of work and why? Two people. Um, it's quite a, quite a simple, uh, it's probably quite an obvious one. Um, Alice Foxkit, Alice Plunkett, uh, because she is incredible at her job. She's so passionate. She's so knowledgeable, but she is superwoman in my eyes you know she oh, has she's four children yeah. william a, a yard full of horses so many animals they're coming out of her ears. Dead, like hatching chicks yeah exactly i mean she's just absolutely incredible and she does it all with a smile and she has she is so kind and shows so much sort of um generosity that i think she is basically i i mean i would refer to her as queen alice to be honest. Yeah, like, a million percent. She was actually, it was really funny. She was on the phone to Tara and she was really hoping that school would start before Cheltenham because she had a very busy week at Cheltenham and she was homeschooling four children of all different ages at all different schools. I mean, that's not even bringing William into the equation. No, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Sorry, um, there were other ones. Yeah, so Alice definitely and Claire Balding, who I oh. think has kind of led the way in, you know, female sports presenters in my eyes. And she's, Again, unbelievably passionate and does her homework. She's so knowledgeable. Whatever sport she covers, she she makes sure she knows it. And I think yeah. she's so knowledgeable on so many sports. Yeah. And like I say, she just changed the game for female present presenters yes. just massively. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, I think the fact that she's so respected by so many men, considering she was one of the first. Yeah. You know, like yeah, no, she's she's incredible. She's really great. Two great people. <laughs> I've said, you know. I've, I just think they're brilliant. Every time I see them, I'm like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember the first time I ever met Claire Balding. I was quite honestly being a fangirl, trying to play it really, really cool. And got through a conversation. I think it was Burley 2016. So it was first year of BBC there. And I got through the conversation. She had called me by my name, which I about wet myself. <laughs> um, and then I came away from the conversation. I was like, oh, I've got through it. And realised that I had a puppy who I didn't have with me at the time. So there wasn't even a plausible explanation. He had gone off around the event with somebody else. I had puppy slobber all down my chest. And I was like, oh, oh my God. never mind. Oh, no. <laughs> and she probably thought, yeah, I'm not going to forget her, the girl with the slobber all down his front. Yeah, that's why she remembered. It's like, oh, Nicole, the slobber. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was mortified. But, oh, do you know oh, what? It it's is. a real life moment. Brilliant. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, um, do you ever have a not so great day in the office? And if so, what do you say to yourself? Oh God, absolutely. I'm sure everybody does. Um, I I would be quite hard on myself as I've already said. I would definitely be critical, and um, I would remember the first leg of Event Rider Masters 2017, and we had a, a new TV production company. They were on board. It was Chatsworth. And it was my first event as anchor, felt like a lot of pressure. And they counted me down in my ear. I knew what I was going to say. And that first sentence just went. Blah, blah, blah. And, oh. and I literally, I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my God. I don't know what I said. It didn't come out right. I totally fluffed it. And I was completely and utterly gutted. I was like, of all the times to just. But but you know what? It was fine. And I, I took a deep breath and carried on and sort of just, but I've never forgotten it. So from work wise, there's always things that you, you just kind of go, oh God, wish I hadn't done that or wish I hadn't said that. Or that was an awkward question to ask. Um, from a home perspective, I very much, it's a juggle. You know, mum guilt is real. And I always feel like I'm not doing enough of you know, I'm not giving Toby enough attention or home enough attention or I'm giving work not enough attention. And so it's just a juggle. Um, yeah. But I definitely say that that's, you know, work in progress to get it right. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. And do you still get nervous if you if you ever had something similar like that happen since? Yeah, I mean, I still get nervous. That's the one I really, really remember. Um, and I'm sure there have been other occasions. That one was just such a fluffer at the wrong moment. Um, because at the sure. beginning, you're out of the way and you're like, right, this yeah, is perfect okay, today. Move on. <laughs> um, so that was definitely one. I would say that I, I do, I mean, I would get horribly, horribly nervous, particularly in the early, like the last few years. Um, depending on you know what event I'm going to who I'm working with that kind of thing and, and where it's going you know I always get very very nervous for BBC and stuff um I get less nervous now than I used to maybe I've got better at dealing with it um I'm probably more confident with it um I know what to expect but I've always been one to keep pushing myself out of my comfort zone so yes I have been known to dash in for porcelain and throw up before I go live um <laughs> But that was, I mean, that's a few years ago now. But yes, I definitely get nervous. It became a bit of a running joke on ERM in so much as I actually almost had the producer kind of time it into the running schedule of rehearsals and stuff. That I needed to go for my nervous week. And I always would forget that literally everybody in the soundtrack would hear me chat. And I would just be chatting to the producer and director who I would be quite friendly with because I talked to them a lot. And and I'd just announced I was off for my nervous wee and everybody would hear me and I was just like, oh, do you know what? <laughs> oh, well, this what is real. Is. <laughs> exactly, this is real life. Um, so, yes, I think if you're not nervous, not that you don't care enough, but nerves are good. You can channel nerves into making you better Absolutely. and it gets the adrenaline going. Yeah. And the countdown in my ear before live TV is basically my equivalent of the start box cross country. Okay. Like that that's it for me absolutely and as soon as you take that first stride out of the start box you're like Phew, and the adrenaline yeah. comes and absolutely. you yeah. find that gear that you don't know that you, that you can't find unless you're presenting exactly yeah. yeah yeah sure yeah. that's really interesting i never have had you down as a as a nervous run for a little throw up. oh yeah <laughs> um i mean i was i was taking it wrong that was a while ago now but it has it has happened um and i would definitely be one to kind of take a deep breath Absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, it's just good to know because you know, there's people. People could be watching this and they could be wanting to follow your path and might think, "Oh, I get too nervous, can't do it." And just to know that you've been there and that coping with it and everything, it's just really interesting. It's you don't see that side of things. You just see you on BBC One for you know the big burly and everything. You don't you don't see that side. So I would say another another time was the first ERM leg I ever went to, which must have been Chats with 2016. It was the first one. And I'd sort of, I didn't really quite believe that I'd managed to get myself involved and was just being really helpful, basically. And I remember being in the car before I got there and I rang Oliver and I think he could tell I was very much like, oh my God. And he talked me down from the edge. I mean, I think I'd have got in the car and like run away somewhere. Oh, really? Um but do you know what, actually, I guess maybe it's that just kind of having that support of going, no, actually, you can do this. You deserve to do this. Like, yeah. go for it. Just get stuck in. And I've got better at that as I've got older. Yeah, no, absolutely. Backing yourself and believing in yourself. And yeah, 100%. I think you're much less likely to do that when you're when you're younger because you think, I'm just a kid. How did I get here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but do you know what? If you find yourself in that opportunity, grasp it. Yeah, enjoy yeah. it. You know, take yeah. make the most of it because... Who knows when when they come round again, and um, that's your chance. So yeah. just give it everything you've got. Yeah, no, totally. Um, can you describe a typical day in the life of Nicole working at an event? Um, very much depends what event it is. Oh, I it? mean, yeah. So it. I mean, if you're going to, um, you know, Burley, for example, as part of the BBC team. It actually starts before that day. So even if I'm just doing cross country, you know, there's um, production meetings beforehand. You want to have made sure you've bought the course, you've got all of your notes, your prep, your homework, you know what you're talking about. Um, but on the day, you generally, I think people, I often find it at events, you know, I have friends that might be there and they're like, oh, will you come and meet us for a coffee or a picnic or stop by? And I, I literally don't stop you you just go 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 I'm sure you find it as well you just go 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 um because you're busy 
doing your job and ultimately making sure that you're as prepared as possible. You can never have done too much research. No. So even if I did find myself with a spare 20 minutes, um, I would do do that. I'd be doing that. I'd be going for a week. But, you know, um, <laughs> you, you definitely just go, I suppose, you get to an event before most other people. Yeah. It's always one of my favourite moments, actually. When you arrive on site and everything's really quiet, um, particularly on cross country day of a big five star because there's that anticipation and everybody's a bit nervous and jittery, but there's so much expectation. Um, so, and it's usually a bit cold and misty at that yeah, time. Yeah. It's just kind of, yeah, it's really special. And like the yeah. security is like just waking up and they're like, hi, and you go, yeah, like, exactly. I'm part of this. Like, yeah, it's a really, having watched it on telly for years to suddenly be part of it. Yeah, no, I, I get what you mean. I had that with badminton. I've actually only done one five star um which was badminton 2019 and it was um I've just, actually I've worked at Blenheim as well so I've done four star and yeah I, exactly that it's it's you're something you're part of something special and like you say you're so busy you can't stop and see friends but because you love it and it's your job it's still like I'm busy doing this exactly. so, so um, but for yeah. me what I do in my opinion in, for, for me it's the best seat in the house yeah, so I, yeah. I think feel very very lucky. But you basically you just you you'd get up, you would get to the event, you would make sure you've got all of your paperwork, you would go to make sure you know all of your equipment, what works, what buttons you should press, what buttons you shouldn't press, where the off switch is, which is always the most important thing to learn. Um, and I guess from there, really, it's just countdown to to first horse, and and when the competition gets going, really, it's fairly relentless. Like you're yeah. just you're just going oh my god yeah no just combination after combination no you must be exhausted afterwards you must just get like a after yes yeah absolutely yeah I usually take a while to come down yeah and then when I get home Oliver says to me that I'm commentating at home and I'm like sorry that's so funny (laughs) that's so funny because my partner did the same when I got back from um badminton and I I think I'd just been there on one of the uh dressage days and I got back and he was like okay he was like it's 11 p.m and you're still on a high just talking and I'm like yeah but you don't understand and yeah it's exactly the same next time Gabby just ring me God, <laughs> <finished>. <laughs> did you see this yes yeah. <laughs> yeah no I'll take you off of that um so who's your favorite combination to watch competing oh I've got a few I'm not very I'm I just I like to pick lots of random people I've got a few different favorites going on I would say that Tom McEwen and Toledo de Curses cross country round at Poe last year was next level yeah um jumped a different track to everybody else yeah he was just phenomenal um and I love to see that like for me you know that cross country making it look easy the partnership and it doesn't always have to look totally effortless it can be a degree of getting it done um but they but love, understanding each other yeah the absolutely situation, they get out of it together and it's like yeah absolutely um so I would say I'm quite partial to Toledo to Cursa um Laura Collett's London 52 is obviously absolutely class particularly on the flat I think he's super super flashy um his dressage you always kind of sit up a bit straighter and take note um likewise if if I don't say this combination, then Dermot from Echo Ratings will come and haunt me. And but SAP Hill, Bob Ingleton got always phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, just differently unbelievable. Yes, yeah, like, very, very good. Yeah, incredible. I've probably forgotten a load. I'm gonna be like, oh, damn it, why didn't I say that? <laughs> yeah. Um. So what? Oh, this is again seems like a silly question. What are your future aims for your career? I mean. Kind of seems like you've hit most of the. No, 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 no. Um, I would love to do an Olympics. I've never done an Olympic. I'd love to do an Olympics. Amazing. Um, I, I guess, I'm really lucky to love what I do. So as long as I keep enjoying it, I couldn't do the juggling that I do if I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Um, because I, I mean, I think I'd sink. Um, yeah. so an olympics 100 percent would be on the cards that would that would be a, a real career goal um yeah. and then i guess to to kind of keep getting better yeah that, you know even if it's doing the same events that i'm doing now but to be better at them yeah um, self-growth yeah like, yeah like michael young isn't sat there thinking i'm the best he's thinking about how he can get he is, he's polishing his medals he's <laughs> polishing his two gold medals get away many gold medals but two <laughs> gold medals going oh 
Yeah. It's a good fun. feeling. It's a good feeling. <laughs> Not really. Um, okay, so we'll um, chat a bit about ECMA ratings. I was going to do an intro on ECMA ratings and then just thought, probably not, it's way better coming from you. I mean, pretty much everyone watching this will understand. I just find it fascinating. So interesting. Eventually has never seen anything like it. It was, we were missed, the sport was missing it and we didn't even know we were missing it. And there's so many other sports out there that don't have this data. And uh, it just blows my mind when, um, you know, a big event's on and I'm looking at through and equations are just posting and posting and posting. I'm just like, oh, this, this, this is amazing. Where do they get these stats from? So yeah, if you could just give us a bit of an intro on ECHO ratings and what were your steps in the involvement into ECHO ratings? Yeah, so ECHO ratings was set up, I think it was 2010. It was set up um, by Sam Watson, who's the Irish international event rider, and Dermot Byrne, who was formerly a lawyer, um, but was Sam's best friend, had been through school, college, university together. Um, and so they knew they wanted to do something together. Sam is incredibly, um, like he's basically a genius that can ride horses as well and is a thoroughly nice person. Um, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, it was basically they work together to create a data analytics company. Um, and it's kind of taken them on different paths to an, to an extent. It's about making the sport safer. So it's analyzing the data to make the sport safer, um, making sure that it can be as safe as possible. Um, from the media perspective, very much, you know, making sure that things are put into context. And from a commentator, so I worked with D first of all, I guess, as part of the Event Rider Masters team. And I got it. Like I was that person that had been sat in a corner working out an average by myself by looking up on the FBI database because I thought it might help me. Yeah. Um, so the fact that they had been able to put all of these things into context and it is such a powerful tool for events. When Michael Young won badminton, I think it was 2016, you could say, you know, Michael Young has won badminton. But actually, the headlines were Michael Young has won badminton on the lowest ever finishing score at the event. Like being able to say that is yeah. make, puts it into context. It's not Mickey just winning again. It's yeah. actually breaking a record. So yeah. the records, that kind of thing, just make the world of difference to events um, and kind of promoting our sport as well. And, and this is and I guess you can kind of look as to whether they've got a prediction center, which kind of analyzes chances. Um, you know, we've never really talked about favorites in eventing before, but now we can, we can yeah. say, well, they're a favorite because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and it, it just, to me, elevates the sport to the next level. Um, it really gives something extra. And they work with high performance teams and, you know, those marginal gains that they can offer as well. So there's various different sort of arms to the company and, and they are, brilliant brilliant people it's a brilliant company with really lovely people working for them that it's a really really nice team and so when we worked together 2016 in the event rider masters um we basically i think kind of understood that i got it like i really did get it we got on really really well and d came to me and like i think it was september 2016 and said oh sam and i have been chatting um, he Sam had actually registered the domain name eventingpodcast.com years ago um, on the basis that actually it might be something to do in the future. Yeah. And they said, oh, we're thinking of doing a podcast, but we want you to host it. Would you be interested? And I was like, well, I've never listened to a podcast, I don't think. I, I really, I was like, podcast, go and look up a podcast. Um, <laughs> but I loved the idea. I loved the concept. There was nothing really in sort of um what we were thinking of around the sort of the previews yeah. because we started looking at the previews and the reviews of the big events so what would quite often happen is you know the big big events would have um, an article in the horse and how does part of the build up and there would be more coverage online throughout the event that kind of thing um but then everybody sort of went home and there'd be a write-up and that was it what we really wanted to capture was the excitement and kind of give people a reason if they were going to an event say look out for them because of this yeah and they would feel like the excitement and the love and the energy that we felt for eventing yeah um and to be honest it's grown massively I think if you'd have said to any one of us three back in 2016 that it would be where it is now we would have gone oh no 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 it's not that's that's mad um so it has grown hugely 
and I love it. I, I mean, I, I basically, podcasting is a massive, massive part of my life now. Um, I record multiple times a day. Really? Sometimes, yeah. Gosh, yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. Okay, so you're, you're doing a lot. Yeah, we do a lot because I do, um, so I do the Ecoratings Venting podcast host that and we have a really, really great team that, that do it and we've sort of, it, our shows have evolved so we obviously do the previews and reviews and actually last year was quite a, an opportunity I guess for the podcast because there were no previews and reviews of events to do and so we sort of thought outside the box and we'd done a few um, interviews and that kind of thing before but we really kind of knuckled down and yeah. kind of dug a bit deeper and so we've got some really sort of good different series and there's a bit of something for everyone there's like the really in-depth interviews looking back and kind of digging beneath the surface of riders and what makes them tick and that kind of thing and course designers and all of that and then there's the sort of fun, mad, alphabetical spaghetti shows where we're all completely bonkers. But, yeah, I love those. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there's a real variety, but I do that and I also host the USDA podcast, which is really fun, actually, because I didn't know a massive amount about US eventing. Um, and I'm a big US eventing fan now. I mean, I think they're really? building a really, really strong team. Yeah, absolutely. They've had a real sort of changeover period over the last few years, um, but they've got a really, really good team of horses. They've got a great... Um, organization behind them um so yeah it's really interesting to do that as well as the educational pieces I think I look back and I think if I knew what I know now back when I was really riding yeah then, I mean I look back at some of the stuff I did I won't mention that to anybody <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking um you know but Youth, youthful ignorance and we didn't know any better we weren't overly experienced and just sort of cracked on but um I'm lucky to get lots of different kind of inputs from different directions and kind of learn from those um so yeah that was how the podcast came about and it's grown and grown and grown um yeah so what did you think when um uh Sam and Durham approached you and they were you know you said okay yeah what's the podcast but I'll do it sort of thing did you have any idea on how it would be, um, how we would react to it, how it would be received? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, we we weren't over sure because podcasting has grown enormously over yeah. the last few years. It's been it's been a growing medium, yeah. based mm -hmm. of, of getting sort of um, information out yeah. there. Yeah, but it it also it isn't the easiest thing to do you know like you know it takes a lot of commitment and editing and piecing it together and organization and um consistency mm -hmm. so we didn't really know how it was going to go down we were hopeful that it was going to be um you know a real success but I don't think we expected to be getting um you know on average over a thousand downloads every day um we, yeah. I think we had 360 something mm -hmm. thousand downloads last year and I think I'm checking my we're, we're over 800,000 downloads in total um Amazing. which is incredible, incredible. For, for an event for a for a small sport like yeah. that is a, a specific sport it's not yeah. like football or golf or cricket it's no, a, no. you know it's, it's a yeah. um a smaller sport yeah it, it's been it's been quite a journey um, I've learned a lot along the way, um, but I um, feel very lucky to be, you know, involved in it, and yeah. I love it. It's a bit of my baby, to be honest. Yeah, it's 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 great, and it, the the podcast is so great. It's so relaxed. It's you feel like we're just in the room with you guys chatting, and it's it's so nice to like you say, eventing was just either you read the preview on the horse and hound or you watch it, and okay, yes, we've got social media now, but to have a podcast on tap to be talking about, you know our favorite sport that we can just dip in and also it's great for riders because you yeah. just, when you're riding you chuck your earphones in and yeah you just listen away and you and I think it's really good to sometimes reinforce why you're going out on that miserable hack in December yeah and and do you know what the, the world we live in now is we're all constantly on the go aren't we we don't as much as we would like to sit down and read something, we don't always get that opportunity. No. Um, and so podcasts, you can take them with you anywhere. Yeah. Whether you're dog walking, in the yeah. car, in the gym. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Well, whatever you're doing, riding, whatever you're doing, it can just go with you. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. No, um, 
so yeah it's been it's been a real journey um but it, it it's been I, i'm excited to see where it goes next yeah no absolutely You're just on the app it's really exciting um so we mentioned briefly about eventing manager um and obviously to the barn had a league for arkan i got yeah. so into it it was so yeah. exciting yeah and um, and it's kentucky this week um yes. it's a five star and so you guys have got the event manager app is open isn't it um so yeah can you just tell us a bit about how that works and, and what's why people should do it yeah so i guess one of the arms of, of echo ratings is very much fan engagement you know we you, we want it, it to be more than just um you know sitting watching you want to become invested in what's happening and i guess the easiest way to describe eventing manager it was launched last year it was actually launched um just after lockdown it was always the plan that it was going to be launched so it was on simulated events for a few events last year yeah um but it is now very much live eventing and you don't know what's going to happen so essentially the easiest way to describe it is you have got um it's like fantasy football for eventing so using sap predictive analytics basically breaks down the field and gives each combination a price yeah um and you then have to buy Four combinations to compete for you in your eventing manager team um but you only have and this is the kicker you only have 10 million dollars to spend and let me tell you you cannot buy everybody you want for 10 no. million dollars no. um so you have to get a bit tactical you could go for three expensive players and a really cheap player because three scores counts so you could kind of take a bit of a gamble you could go for four sort of medium medium price players um and essentially you then get entered into one big league and so you play against people from all over the world, thousands of other people. And you can also play against your friends and family. So if you've got a yard, you can play against the other people at your yard. Kind of, you know, it's nice for bragging rights. It's quite yeah, competitive. Yeah. It's really competitive. Um, and you can, you know, really get involved. You can play for brands. So you could have played for To The Barn last year and then the brands go up against each other. Um, so it's really cool. And one thing that we have just launched, um, so for Kentucky, the eventing podcast is putting up a thousand euro prize for any person who can get in the top 100 at Kentucky, top 100 at Le Moulin, and the top 100 at Burley. So it sounds straightforward, doesn't it? You've got to get in the top 100. Yeah, that's doable. So the 100 people from Kentucky then have to get in the top 100 at Le Moulin and then have to get into the. That's amazing. Top. That's I mean, if there's 50 people still in it by Burley, the boys will be getting very twitchy. <laughs> they um, twitchy. <laughs> but, yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's interesting because we, one thing about the podcast is we very much want it to be about like listeners and engagement and we want people to share it and enjoy it and everything else. And we, we've been working with a few more brands this year and have a few more shows going out. And we thought we'd really like to put some money back in and kind of give somebody the opportunity to, to win. So yeah, Exciting. It's really cool. It's really cool. I actually need to pick my team. I remember with Arkan, I was, I think I, I picked Ingrid and Michael Young, and I was like, well, I have about 200k left. Yeah. Go what on. am I going to do? Oh. <laughs> so. it, it's really fun, actually, um, because you can get as invested in it as you like. Like, you can go in and you can study all of the kind of the individual breakdown stats for each of the riders are in the app you can yeah. look at those you can go right okay let's be really tactical about this who has the best six run average in the dressage who has the best cross-country jumping reliability all of those things yeah or you can go oh i like Ballamore class because he's great i'm gonna yeah. pick him or you can literally press an autofill button and yeah. the computer will pick a team within budget um yeah. and uh, I mean, I'm horribly bad <laughs> as eventing manager. <laughs> I've been really, really poor. When it was the simulated events, I didn't really play because obviously I was commentating on it and so it yeah. wasn't, wasn't right. But now we've got real life eventing events. Yes, I'm going to really take this seriously. Now I'm a bit like, I should have just auto-filled. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> That's great. Um, but just if, if you want to play, anybody watching, if you want to play, it is free to download in the App Store or on Google Play. And you can just find it, get your friends involved, play against them and win some money, win some prizes. Yeah, yeah win some prizes. Cool. So um, we'll just touch on the current climate, which hopefully we're edging out of. We can go to the pub now. Um, yeah. But obviously, COVID had a huge effect on the 2020 event season. And I still don't think that we're going to look back at 2021 events and season and think it's entirely normal. Um, 
do, how do you think this will affect top horses and riders at this year's five star events and Olympics? It's interesting um, because I think there will be teams like the US team in particular who actually another year for them. They're they're quietly pretty happy about it. Not obviously about the whole COVID situation, but they're not disappointed that the Olympics has been put off a year from their team's chances. You know, all of their horses are young horses. They get another year's mileage, yeah. another year's experience under their belt. Yeah. You know, for them, actually, it could turn out to be a real benefit. Um, so I would say for teams like the US team, that there's a lot to to really kind of build on going into the year. And I think it would be of an advantage to them if you could say such a thing. I mean, obviously, there's been so much disruption. I don't think it would be a massive advantage. But in comparison to other teams, they're a young squad. Yeah. They Eric Duvander came on, I think he joined before the 2018 World Equestrian Games, I think. So he was fairly new in post. Yeah. Um, and so there's been chance to sort of him to really embed his team and kind of get to know all of the horse and riders yeah. and really work with them. But on the other side of it, you know, you look at Ingrid Glimpka's SAP Hale Bob and actually, you know, he's a double European champion. He's been on the podium at the World Games. He should be going to the Olympics as the gold medal favourite, but he's a year older. Yeah. I'm trying to definitely rack my brains and remember he's either 16 or 17 this year. I want to say he's 17 and this time. Um, and so you kind of go, okay, well, actually, age isn't on his side. And Ingrid yeah. has another really, really good horse coming through in SAP Ashapi. And you think, actually, that could be the horse that steps up. You don't know how how they're going to come out this year. I mean, I think um, Hale Bob has actually had his first run at a three-star short and went very well. Finished on like a 22 or something. So, yeah. you know, pretty decent. Yeah, um, take that. <laughs> well, about take that. Uh, but, you know, it's that sort of different end of the spectrum. You know, horses um, might be heading into the later years of their career. And yes, they've missed a season and they've not necessarily had the mileage on their legs. But does it, is it a disadvantage? Possibly, yeah. Um, I think it would be interesting. Time. It wasn't like a definite off time. It was a, oh, event might come back. It might not. Who's yeah. gonna know? Should we and give the horse just time off or not? It's, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of them would have done all of their fast work for the spring five, five stars last year. So they would have done all of the, the really, really hard work yeah. leading up to it, thinking, you know, obviously having absolutely no idea what was about to happen. Um, so I think it's a bit of a mix. I, I, I mean, you can never write off the likes of Ingrid and Hellbob at all I'm not saying that but you know I would say that the experience of some of the younger horses coming through and making a name for themselves like Laura Collins London 52 actually the last 12 months have been brilliant for him yeah. um, and he's really grown up and sort of come into his own so yeah it's exciting isn't it though like it adds a whole different dimension we've all sort of been will it happen will it happen will it happen yeah. um, and we actually sat down a couple of weeks ago and we're like we kind of need to get organised because I think I think it's coming. Um, yeah, yeah. We didn't sort of want to jinx it, but it'll be interesting to see final preparations. And the British team is extraordinarily strong, so there'll be disappointment. Of course, yeah. there will be. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And um, just in terms of you know pre-match runs, um, you know, with no badminton, I assume riders will be looking at just doing plenty of four-star longs if they can full star shorts to it comes yeah. up the olympics comes up quite quickly <clears throat> in our season if we've you know if we've lost badminton obviously there's kentucky but um yeah i think i mean so over in america for example their spring calendar has been brilliant this spring they, they everything has gone ahead as it should have gone ahead nowhere's cancelled or moved or anything like that it's all systems go and all of the u.s riders their plan was kentucky so for them everything has gone to plan yeah the British riders going out to Kentucky, obviously, great. And, and, and sort of the British based riders as such. It's a yeah. great chance for a five-star run this spring. Losing badminton, I think most people will stick four-star short because there isn't actually a four-star long now in the calendar. Apart from Victim, which has replaced Bramham at the beginning of June. Yeah. But that's quite late yeah. as such mm -hmm. to then turn around from a long format to another long format in Tokyo at the end of July, in theory. I mean, it's doable, but you just wonder whether I think... You're waiting till then to consolidate your hopes and ambitions. Yeah, the I mean, I would say Chris Bartle and Dickie Waygood will have a very good idea of 
who they would be looking to take and will know where they want people to run or what they would like them to do. I don't think they'll announce anything until as late as possible. Um, but I would say that Le Moulin again, end of June, you wouldn't necessarily run at Le Moulin and then look to go to Tokyo. Um, so if you're in with a chance of Tokyo, you're probably not going to run at Le Moulin. Laura yeah. Collett was on the eventing podcast a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, on the NAF Cup of Tea show and basically said that. She said, if 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 I'm in with a chance of Tokyo, I'm not taking him to Le Moulin because it's too close. So it'll be interesting. I think we'll see a lot of four-star shorts. I think we'll see very competitive ones. Um, but I think the spanner in the, you know, works from badminton going means that plans have been written and rewritten. And... Yeah. That's exciting though, if we get lots of four-star shorts to watch. <laughs> it's, it's good fun to watch, yeah. isn't it? It's good fun to watch, so... Yeah, we um, can't complain. So who are your ones to watch for the Aventi Olympics and also the Europeans? It'll be really interesting to see team tactics. Um, so for the Europeans, obviously, the riders are very much still wanting to be going. Um, you know, even those riders that have been to the Olympics, they'll have other horses. So, for example, Michael Young will have other horses. Ingrid Klimt, as I've already said, SAP Ashapi, Hale Bob, you would like to think one would be at one, one would be at the other. Yeah. Um, the Germans are formidable, absolutely formidable. They have had an incredible record um, at championships over the last few years. I think at the Europeans, they've taken the top two individual places at the last three, maybe yeah. four European championships. Yeah. I want to say four European championships because 2013 yeah it's it, like incredible wow. record, incredible strength um Michael Young is the double Olympic champion he's the only well he's the only person to finish on his dressage score at an Olympic Games and he's done it twice I oh, mean yeah. that's just insane I to do things really well and then just back yeah up. exactly it's not um, <laughs> So I would say, you know, the Germans are, are very much the ones with the target on their back. The British team is exceptionally strong. It's hard having so much choice um, because, you know, it's a great position to be in, but there will be disappointed riders and you could make a case for a lot of them. So I'm fascinated to see how that sort of pans out. I, Toledo de Curso, I've already mentioned, I love him. I think he's class. Um will be fascinating to see how he takes on Tokyo. Yeah. The, the prices, you can never discount them. Um, Oliver Townend, again, I mean, Ballamore class, in my opinion, is one of the best horses in the world. Yeah, um, I agree. So, you know, there is so many combinations that you could sort of make a challenge for, and um, it'll be interesting to see how it does play out. I, I definitely am going to agonise over my eventing manager team and my eventing podcast prediction podium for, for Tokyo. I think I I had to, um, I did a, a prediction um, earlier in the year as to who would be on the podium for Horse and Hound. And, and I said, I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to change it. And looking back, I'm like, I need to change it. I need ah. to change it. <laughs> yeah. It's just so difficult, isn't it? You just, there's so many good combinations. Um, it'll, it's, we're lucky we're lucky we get to enjoy it you know after yeah. the last year you think yeah. great I mean and just the, yeah like the caliber of riders and horses and partnerships and that every year he, that you know the course designers go out to make it to design and build a trickier track and every year there are horses that come home inside the time clear and it's like they're just laughing they're like <laughs> that didn't fool me I and know horses just like yeah and and what's next like Laura at home you know, class, absolutely class. That's unbelievably easy. And like, um, I was really lucky in May 2019 at Badminton. Um, I got to walk the course with William Fox Pitt because he's involved with to the barn and he was doing some course walks. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, this is work. I'm completely fangirling. And um, he said, going to the uh, large Oxa bridge over the, like, Vicarage V, but it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, and he was like, so I'm coming towards it. I want my horse's right hoof to be there. And I was like, what? Um, he was like, just there. And then I'll get that. And I was like, right, okay. And he walked the whole course and he says, so I'll be looking at that there. I'll be looking at that tree through those other trees, that exact one there, that leaf, that's what I, and you're like, like, how can you be so precise? I'm sure he doesn't know, like, what colour t-shirt he's supposed to be wearing. Like, you know? Like, and he's like this. Anyway, you watch him do it and go, 
clear on two, four, a uh, five-star debutants, and you're like, mm. okay, he did it. Yeah, he did it. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's it's amazing. And we're so lucky he, we can see so many people like yeah. this. Yeah, like and, and I do. When we when you said earlier, you know, Michael Young never stops learning. Andrew Nicholson was on the show recently, and was he's he's an incredible person to talk to, in as so much as you can kind of really that he doesn't. He's very considered about what he says, and you know when he talks, you listen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was involved with the German team back here, where he's been involved with their cross country over. So this was 2017, the year that he won on the Rio, and he had arranged. He said, "I'll walk the course with with you guys. Um, be at the start box for eight o'clock." Mm-hmm. And he said he got to the start box for quarter to eight, and Michael Young was there waiting for him. And he said that that felt really good. And I thought, yeah, yeah, but it did. But it, it and it's fascinating to kind of, you know, even these really, really top riders will keep learning from other people um, yeah. and will keep sort of soaking it in. So, yeah, it's interesting. Really, really interesting. Really interesting. Um, cool. So we'll just talk a little bit about like personal life and um, what you like to do outside of work. And you said that you... <laughs> You rode, you grew up riding and you have a horse at the moment, but when you're not renovating a house and being a mum and working, what do you like to do? <laughs> you pretty much named all of the <laughs> things. I, mean, I, guess, I guess, to be honest, my work is also my hobby because I love it. Um, and, and do you know what? I've considered getting another horse so many times. I don't have time at the minute. I really physically don't have time. And I couldn't do what I do now and have a horse at home and therefore something you'd have to give. Um, and yeah, so I, that would be mostly it, I think. I like I like the odd shopping trip, pre-COVID times. Um, but family, Toby, um, that has been life basically for well, that's what i love the fact that you don't feel like you're working when you're working and you have to love your job if you're going to be going away over weekend yeah. and you know, missing friends parties and things like that yeah. like well actually it's okay if i'm sat at badminton like it's Absolutely. worth it yeah <laughs> exactly so have you got a secret to how you juggle your busy lifestyle i don't i don't think i've got it right yet um <laughs> i you know yeah, what i i have no no secret apart from be organized yeah. and work hard like yeah. i will literally toby is a very early riser so he'll wake up at normally before 5 a.m oh. um i know and and literally i don't stop yeah because if i stop i'll, I'll stop and not get yeah. going again yeah. um but i'll just keep going keep going and then quite often i do a lot of my recordings in an evening like we're doing now and yeah. um, because he's in bed and so yeah. i'm sort of worried about that um, it's a bit easier now. Obviously, he's back at nursery because he wasn't over most of the lockdowns. So we had a year almost without childcare. So that was quite a balance. Yeah. Um, mm. a multitask a lot. Yeah. Um, and just kind of get stuck in, I guess. Just crack on, yeah. juggle, and then drink wine when it all gets yeah. a bit too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but yeah no secret no secret I don't think I've got it right I don't think I've got it right I constantly try to to get better at it and be better at it but um it looks like, you, it looks like you've got it right yeah. I'm just enjoying your uh, videos going for walks with Toby and you're like oh we've just been stood here for 10 minutes jumping in this puddle <laughs> yeah he loves it he loves it I mean he's a proper little sort of just loves mud water dirt tractors the, uh, I was a little bit late for this because he was determined not to go to bed because he was just going up a digger up a digger but <laughs> not going for a drive in the digger now it's bedtime oh. um so yeah do you know what he's he's brilliant age and he's brilliant entertainment and I think god I'm so lucky oh. so so lucky makes it worth it makes it only more yeah, <laughs> Cool. So we've just got a few fan questions. Mm-hmm. Um, who is your favourite rider to interview and why? I Do you know what? There's a few. So I I mean, Tom Carleal is always interesting because you never know quite what he's going to say. Yeah. Um, Alex Bragg is great. Because yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Cool. We've had him like, on the one chats with. So good. Really like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. He's enthusiastic. Um, he's very, very considered, but passionate and hardworking and doesn't believe in the word can't yeah um so he's brilliant um I love people as I said a bit earlier that you have to dig a bit beneath the surface yeah um I'm really not quite I I love a lot of different guests 
to be yeah. honest. Yeah. So every, all different guests, they throw up different challenges. Yeah, different things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, where would you most like to commentate that you haven't already? I guess you've answered that just the Olympics, or is that at other places? Olympics. Arkin would be amazing. I'd love to do Arkin at the Olympics. Definitely. Um, yeah. Which of the three phases do you find most exciting and it's interesting to present because I'm sure I mean they've, they've all got their own you know you dress hard you've got the first like time that you're seeing any of the combinations together this country doesn't need any explanation why it's exciting but then the show jumping like how awesome is eventing in the way that it's just oh you knock that pole and there's this many thousands of pounds and this place you drop you know and it, you know yeah so, so I love them all I really do love them all and dress hard you have more time so that you can get more things in there. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, cross country, like the thrill of live cross country and you don't know what's coming um, and you just are so instinctive with what you say. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think of lines or anything like that. It just comes out. And, it, you know, it's probably come from a lot of research and a lot yeah. of, you know, I listen to other people a lot and that kind of thing. So I w- have done my homework in that respect. But it's just off the cuff. Like, you don't know what could happen and anything can happen. And you yeah. get all manner of things, um, yeah. you know, that go wrong. So, yes, definitely cross country um, and particularly reverse order cross country. Love a bit of reverse order cross country. Yes. And a four star short, like ERM sort of yes. theme, um, you know, a lot on the line, tough time. It's just pressure. I love it. Yeah, how the riders respond to the pressure as well. Because even though they're professionals, like, yeah, they're they're still human. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I said at the beginning, yeah, what what was it like to work? This is a fun question for me. What was it like? uh, What is it like to work on ERM? Because it's such an exciting new concept for the sport. And um, yeah, it was um, the the chance to interview. Oh, yeah, so it's like chance to interview the very best. And like you say, this whole new format of the sport where you've got the reverse order um, cross country and it's the really exciting you got the live podium you know so what was that like I loved it like absolutely loved it um like it was just or it is just such a a real I guess all the best bits of my job wrapped up um I get to do the the presenting side of things the commentary side of things um you get to go to some amazing events the best riders in the world and and do you know what we don't have a huge amount of prize money in eventing and it brings out the best in in competitors to you know to get out there and give it their best shot and to ride and to be competitive and yeah. and drama and makes great sport yeah um and I love eventing and I want other people to love it. I want to showcase it to other people who might not be familiar with it or might have a few preconceived ideas of it. I want them to get sucked in and love it. And I think it did a brilliant job of showcasing that sport a hundred percent. Um it's I love it. <laughs> have I said I love it? No, yeah. it, it's a real it's a real treat. Um the whole team are brilliant and all of the riders are superb. Um, but it's great competition. Like, I don't think I've been to an event rider master's leg that hasn't been great competition and had some drama and had some, yeah. like, you know, poles fall or late run outs or tough yeah. times or pins going. And, yeah. you know, it just is drama and it's yeah. great TV and it's great sport and yeah. it's great to be a part of. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's a unique environment for eventing. It's. Mm so pressurized and there's a lot of stats flying around and yeah it's 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 so new and unique and yeah I'm not surprised that you love it because it's really cool we love it <laughs> it's a pleasure to be involved in it really I'm is. sure I'm sure so we have just got a last round of quick fire questions um so one word to describe yourself um uh, family okay <laughs> Um, how old were you when you first started riding? Small. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little Shetland pony called Star who was very naughty um, and was basically, he wants, um, he, he didn't do anything he was told unless my mum was in the vicinity. He adores my mum. But he was Did very, very naughty. And so I fell off lots and <laughs> had great fun. <laughs> um, best piece of advice that you've been given? 
Um, not the if in doubt, knock it out. No, the um, Oliver once said to me that, you know, if you really want to do something and the opportunity comes up, say yes, and then figure out how you do it after. Absolutely. That's that's a great bit of advice. I'm going to carry that. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I think I, I often go say yes and then be like, okay, now I've got to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Make it happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, who is your hero? Um, I loved, I loved Mary King growing up. Like I had posters on the wall. I just loved Mary King, and I've actually interviewed her a couple of times since. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I very unashamedly went, I loved you growing up. I had posters on my wall, <laughs> and she was so kind. And I thought, oh god, so much for playing it cool. I just couldn't help it. It's like word vomit. I was like, oh, I love you. Um, <laughs> But no, I'd probably say Mary King growing up was a big influence in eventing. So that, yeah. Um, what's a strength of yours? Hard work. And a weakness. I would say I would be care too much what other people think sometimes. Uh, what did you have for breakfast today? I actually had a bacon sandwich. Oh. Um, yeah, I had a bacon <laughs> sandwich and I don't normally... Uh, so it was a real treat and it was lovely. <laughs> uh, what's your favourite film? Um, something like Kingsman or yeah. anything with Jason Statham in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see where you're going with this. Yeah, or Magic Mike? <laughs> no, weirdly, no Magic Mike, no. No, um, Pitch Perfect or something. Yeah, I don't really watch a lot of films, but that would definitely be it. If you ask me TV series, I would say Line of Duty. I am obsessed. Oh, I've heard it's amazing. I need to get into it. Oh, <laughs> so good. Uh, your favourite meal? Steak. Oh, and yeah. if there's champagne on offer with the steak, I'd be even Absolutely. happier. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, badminton or Burley? Burley. Favourite event horse ever? growing up I loved King William really really loved King William um he really sort of caught my imagination as a small child so I would say King William um today I think Le Vies Petit Sam just legendary like the incredible feats that he achieved was yeah. just extraordinary yeah totally totally agree with that favorite event rider ever I put this and Tara was like, that's really mean, but yes, ask it. <laughs> um, I mean, I've said Mary King for, because she was my hero. Yeah. So I guess I should stay with that because she really was my heroine growing up. Um, but if uh, Echo Ratings boys are listening, then Sam Watson, I love you too. <laughs> uh, and where do you see yourself in 20 years? I would love to say still doing this, still doing a job I love, being better at it. Um, hopefully we'll have, you know, had lots of different opportunities along the way with a very happy family. Um, I would also love to think that in 20 years I will be 51. And I think I would be perfect for having a, an event horse out in the field that I bumble about on and um, try to look like I know what I'm doing and actually go out to like B80s and just have a lovely, lovely time. So, yeah. That's a nice, that's a nice um, goal for the 20 years time to 80. And lastly, commentating, presenting or podcasting, you can only pick one. You're me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Um, what a way to finish. finish. I have to ask. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> They're like three babies. I love them all equally. I would say... I love podcasting, big part of my life. I love commentating, particularly on a big day. I love getting that excitement across. I'd say presenting. There's something about that live, reactive, um, personal thing. And for somebody that, you know, really hated public speaking growing up, now I kind of, like, I, I, become, I think maybe it's, maybe I was an, sort of, an actress in a former life or something it's like I'm not me when I do it but I think presenting I, th I would say presenting if you really really force me I'll say <laughs> I won't ask you anything like that ever again oh. <laughs> I'll be having dreams tonight I'll be nightmares I'll be like, oh god no. I the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah. 
thank you so much. This has been amazing. It's been so fascinating to talk to you. I've just really, really enjoyed it. It's been a complete fangirling hour and a half for me. Oh, bless you. No, it's been, it's been lovely. I Because I was quite nervous about being on the other side. Um, so <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so much for having me. No, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in the media tents when we can be back there. And just, yeah, it'd be so great to physically meet you. But it's been amazing. So thank you so much, Nicole. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. It won't be long. It won't be long. No, it really won't be. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. Stay in touch. And yeah, see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.